Okay. Welcome everyone. Thanks for coming on a Saturday. Is it better for us to come on a Saturday? Yeah. Yeah, no. <laughs> Depends <laughs> on <what> you mean. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Resounding yes from the corner. Um, well, we've got a few different ideas that I'll make talk to you about now. But first I should just introduce, um, we're here meeting again for the book group, discussing uh, Through the Mists by Robert James Lees, and this week we're up to Chapter 6, The Magnetic Chorale. And I already think this will be part one, because <laughs> it's a big chapter. <laughs> yeah. Has everyone read the chapter? Yeah, yeah awesome. Okay, I just feel like I'm, I sound very echoey. Is that to everyone else? Yeah, is it possible to fix class? Thank you. I know people are Is that a bit better? Yeah, yeah I think that's better. Okay, before we start, I just wanted to say hi. I know we've been away for a few weeks and uh, haven't, haven't seen each other. How did you find the three weeks break? Did it kind of slow you down, progressing and self-reflecting, or was it a welcome relief? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> so, a welcome relief. Okay, well, that's good. I really want to, I was just talking about this morning about um, slowing down everything before the group. Uh, Lena shared with me that She's been talking to some other people as well and just saying that there's so much in this book and if you get a little bit behind, then suddenly we're leagues ahead and um, my real desire is that we really connect with the, the meaning and the messages in this book. So I feel, let's just take it slow. <coughs> we've got, I think we've got three meetings before AJ and I are away again for another month and I don't mind if we spend all three just on the magnetic chorale. <laughs> I think there's enough in there. Um, so my my usual, AJ was just talking to me about this in the car, my usual way of operating, being an occupational therapist, everything is goals orientated. You're measuring goals and, and, and I'm finding this big emotion in me about that, like, okay, what have we ticked? Are they getting it? Have we all grown? And I'm going to let it go. So um, let's just go at our own pace. The other big desire that I is, yep, it's a big desire, but my courage is perhaps growing around it, is that I would like to um, create and run a study group around repentance. And um, it's always great when we go away because AJ and I get a lot of time in the car together and that's good discussion and processing time. <laughs> Um, which is why he usually drives, because he can cry and do anything. We have to hand over the wheel to him so I can press it. But we had a good discussion about, or we had a number of discussions about this idea of mind on the repentance study group. And um, what we decided, uh, what AJ outlined, was really the true process of repentance. And it's not something we're going to get through in six weeks. So uh, I've really looked at how we could run this group and I think if enough of you are interested, we would commence it much like we're commencing the Through the Mists material and that is with the understanding that it will be an extended process. So <laughs> it would be a once a week meeting and we would start with an overview of what true repentance is and then we would start right back there at the beginning with addictions. And we'd spend at least six weeks on addictions and how that relates to repentance. Then we'd move on to fear and how that relates to repentance. And then we'd move on to, to grief and the actual grieving processes involved in repentance. So, um, how does that sound? Does anyone feel like they'd like to cut that off? Yes! <laughs> That's lovely. That's lovely. All right. Well, um, I just have to have a bit more of a feel about that and my own humility and repentance because I really do the material justice. This trip has shown me this last trip when we went away, um, really uncovered in me some addictions that I uh, thought that I'd gotten over, and, and so that was very humbling. And I'm just working away at that um, still now. 
Um, but that's also good, hey? It's just such a gift to be shown. Oh, I just feel such a gift. Every time now we engage these trips and things that we do, I used to like brace and survive <laughs> and, um, and then wait till I get home and then kind of reassess. And since our last big trip at the, end, at the start of this year, I've really been um, going into these trips knowing that they're going to confront everything in me because we're in changing environments with new people all the time and um, yeah, and it, it, by doing that it really shows me a lot of what's still there for me, which is a lot, <laughs> but it, it is a really good process, so yeah, being engaged wherever I am or recognising where I've decided to not engage and go away, <laughs> which also shows me what i so yeah. So that's where I'm at, but my desire is to start a study group with you guys. I don't think we can do it on the same day as book group, because I think we'd all get a little bit yeah. <laughs> So it'll mean another day, and I'm also conscious that, um, you know, there's a lot of support people who help us now with the setup and, and the recording and all of those things. So I want to talk with them and some more with AJ about the best way we can do that, so as to not completely overload everyone. There's quite a lot of material. If you look at that YouTube channel, there's quite a lot of material appearing there pretty constantly, isn't there? And so I know um, that's our desire to create lots of resources for people, but um, it might be a bit much to keep up with, but all of it, I'm not sure. That said, how many chapters are in Through the Mists? Like 21 or something? If we wait till we're finished, <laughs> we might never do it. <laughs> The next, after this one, are quite small. You, you skipped ahead. Oh. <laughs> yeah, all right. Okay, well, let's get on to Through the Mists. Um, before we go to Chapter 6, I received an email from Amanda in England. And she wanted to reflect... Well, she just reflected... Her, her email is entitled, Reflection on Self-Reflection. <laughs> <laughs> but I just thought it was really precious. Um, and I thought we could take five minutes to just uh, recap a little bit chapter five and the lessons that she found there because they do relate very much to chapter six as well. Um, who remembers chapter five after four weeks away? <laughs> yep, Deb, do you want to give us a, a recap? Who's our mic runner, CJ? I could look at my notes, but I did... Just um, off the top of your head. Yeah, just um, he uh, found the home of rest, the grove of trees, and went in and took a seat and fell asleep and had sleep for the last time and yeah. waxed lyrical for four pages on sleep. He did. He yeah. talked a lot about sleep, didn't he? So, <laughs> so in, we talked a lot about our sleep and its purpose, but we also talked a bit about nature. Do you remember? We talked about... Um, the healing properties inherent in nature and um, how that was being demonstrated to us through the chapter. So um, Amanda touches on some of that, but I thought the way she expresses it is very beautiful. So let's, let's go back to chapter five with her. She says, Dear Mary, first, thank you, and thank you and all the rest of the people involved in asking questions, contributing, filming, and all the behind the scenes stuff that make that happens to make it possible for people around the world to join in with the discussions. Just wanted to say, I haven't yet listened to the YouTube of Chapter 5 because I wanted to challenge myself to say something about it without the safety net of hearing what you all discern and felt about it. Very brave, hey? Yeah. <laughs> the first time I read the chapter, as usual, I thought, goodness, I don't understand much of this. <laughs> and I usually go back a few days later and look a bit deeper. I had a feeling that behind some of the words there was a lot of stuff that was relevant to me and needed to be looked at in greater depth. I then started feeling that it was the first third of the chapter that was really important and really home, homing in further, it was these words. When my soul wished to throw itself on the majesty of the infinite and the quiet country lay beyond my reach, I would turn towards Westminster Abbey. It feels to me that Fred is saying that when he needed to connect more intensely or consciously with God and himself, his first choice would be to leave the city behind 
and get out into the peace and tranquility of nature. And if this was not possible, his second choice would be the man-made place of worship. For me, this is a really important distinction. And just to tell you a little bit about Amanda, Amanda's been a practicing Christian for about 20 years, I think. So she's very much accustomed to going to church. Um, I suppose I must have always believed that if you wanted to experience God, you had to go to a church building or some other man-made, special, sacred place where God lived. But now that sort of seems illogical. For me, Fred is making a really important point. The realisation that natural places are ideal for aiding this connection and we shouldn't assume that going to a holy but man-made place will be better. Although he finds the atmosphere in the Abbey helps him digest his emotions and connect to God, I notice that it's not during a service or communion, but alone, contemplating the beauty of the architecture and generally soaking up the spirit of the place, the worship that's happened there, and the beauty of the sun streaming through the stained glass windows. The things that move him are not the sermons and the organ and the liturgy, but the awe-inspiring design. The glass and the silence speak to his soul and enable him to speak heart to heart with God. It reminds me of the power of great art to touch our souls and bring us closer to ourselves and God. Which is a lovely point, isn't it? Yeah. Reading this back, I feel I'm quite fascinated at exploring what promotes these connections. For me, unlike Fred, music has suddenly become a very important way to help me touch some of the deep sadness and misery inside of me. And of course, like everyone else it feels, I'm now hooked on watching films, especially the sad ones. It saddens me to think that many people in churches or temples following religions have no idea that it is possible to connect with God, to throw our souls on the majesty of the infinite outside the building, away from the organisation, and that it is possible to receive his love, a real tangible, tangible substance. How many of us are starving and thirsting for this nourishment, truly like lost sheep? We don't know ourselves and we don't know God. On a happier note, I love the promise that contemplation of ourselves, a willingness to see the truth, prepares us to receive God's transforming love as Fred rests on the moss. I don't know if I've got that right, but it seems to me that Fred's effort at reflection, processing and digesting truth paved the way for his immense transformation that takes place in his appearance and general vitality. With love, Amanda. Hmm. Does anyone have any reflections on Amanda's reflections? <laughs> Sandra? Um, for me, oh, is this working? Yeah. For me, it's the church um, bit that really touches me because I remember, and the singing, because when I was a kid, I was forced into, you know, um, Catholicism. Yeah. But when I was in church by myself, I could feel God. Yeah. <laughs> when I reflect back on that now. And it's yeah. actually a really beautiful place to be by yourself and to, because it is a place of worship, supposedly, you know. And the singing always, we've just done um, a group singing yesterday and it was all very church music and I just loved it. It's yeah. all about God and yeah. It, yeah. that's a beautiful email to reflect on that. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Yeah, I thought it's just lovely to hear a voice from someone also who's come from a religious background and what they're feeling about what we're teaching and reading the book and... Yeah, someone who perhaps... Has anyone been a member of a church for very many years? Yeah, quite a few of you. So, yeah. Yeah, cool. Yeah, I thought it was very nice. And I thought that that message that she highlighted about... And we talked about as well, about the power of nature to connect us with God is so beautiful and actually carries over to this chapter as well. Okay, let's move on to the Magnetic Chorale. Now, this chapter, I think, is about 20 pages long, and every sentence, I think, is... I was trying to think of a word to describe it, because I always go, oh, it's a big chapter, isn't it? But I think the word is rich. It's rich in meaning, isn't it? It's rich in feeling. It's rich in description. So um, what I thought we could do this week and in the coming weeks was rather than, you know, we've sort of been going through our questions and talking about the chapter in that way... 
I thought, what if we actually talk about the chapter in the order that it's written and reflect on our questions as we go through talking about the content? That way we won't get too, hopefully, all jumbled up um, and we can really get into the meaning of each, each part. Now, also what I thought I would do is just, if, some, if any of you would like to help me summarise what actually happens in this chapter. So who can tell me what happens at the beginning of this chapter? <laughs> Just wait for the mic. Yeah. <laughs> um, Frederick hears the pearls of the bells chiming he and he's calling his soul. Yes, and he feels drawn, doesn't he? So, all right. So, the first thing is Fred feels drawn, yep. He doesn't know where he's feel drawn to. No. He's wondering whether it's his home of rest as well. Yes. Okay, what happens after that? Or what do we read about for the next couple of pages? So first he talks about this sensation of being drawn, not knowing where. Yep, Glenda? He also notices that there are others being drawn to the same place. Yes. So if, if in this right now, if we could just get the broad brushstrokes of the events that happen, okay. and then my desire is that we'll go back and really talk about exactly what's happening as Fred's being so drawn. So see, he sees um, a beautiful building that is... Was it Amanda sent that email? Amanda, yes. Yeah. So it's nature and man-made structure combined, each yeah. enhancing the yes. other. Yes, yes. So and he sees the home of rest. Beautiful. With the building at the home of rest. Yeah, what happens next? So he's, he, he's being drawn, he sees the home arrest, he goes there. Suzanne, what's next? At the back. Yeah, to you. He sees everybody come into a big amphitheatre and the men and the women and the children all... Just separate. if you can put the mic, yeah. yeah. Just, is yeah. that better? Yeah. Yes, oh, that's is, better. Yeah. Yeah. And he sees that the, the men and the women and the children all separate into sort of layers and they start to... Not exactly seeing. In fact, I pondered myself. It seems more like toning, perhaps. Yeah. Or, or a, um, a magnetic energy comes from their soul and unites and yep. creates a canopy above the amphitheatre. Yeah. So all these people start coming together and singing or making noise yeah. with their voice. Yeah, what, whatever sound. a magnetic chorale is. Because it doesn't really get... I mean, he does explain it, but you still don't really know. And perhaps it's because nothing like that exists in our experience. Not yet. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so let's yeah. just call it the commencement of the chorale. Yeah. Because there, there's definite stages that he describes, isn't there? There's the commencement, everyone coming together and making the beautiful sounds. What happens next? Uh, yep, Araya. His attention is drawn to the um, people in the centre that are going to be healed. Yeah, and the so healing begins. Actually, the, the patients are brought in. So they're not there at the beginning. Sorry, Deb, what do you want? Just if you pass forward. Uh, they come in much later. Is, they don't come in right away? No, we, we have the commencement of the chorale. Mm -hmm. So people make sounds and there's movement and all of these things. So we're going to discuss that as a section. Mm -hmm. And then... Uh, as Araya said, the patients are brought in. What else happens at that time? What does the conductor of it all do, the Assyrian? Diana? Sort of crucial to that part, yeah? Yeah, I was just... Sorry, I was just going to say that he arrived. <laughs> yes, he arrived. He arrived, yep. yeah, yeah. <laughs> and yep, then, yep. And then he, um, he coordinates... Something else to occur. Um, he does. Yeah. How does he do that? What does he do? Uh, so remember at first Kushner is conducting, yeah. isn't he? And then the Assyrian comes in. And then we, we learn about the purpose of the chorale, don't we? They bring the patients in and then um, Siamides does something very beautiful. What is it? Oh, oh his hands. <laughs> Jane? Um, he... Pray, opens up with a prayer yeah. to God. So he asks God to create a space uh, to help with the healing. So we'll just say the patience and prayer. This is 
remember, we just want to make sure that we cover all the sections, so... With the text, yep. Yeah? Okay, what happens after that? This is where we get heavy in, in actual sort of content of understanding the soul-based issues in this chapter. Yeah, Raya? Well, this is where the healing actually begins and the lifting of the bonds. Yes. For all these um, souls that have been victims of circumstance and yep. have things on them that that necessarily shouldn't have been, that yeah. are going to be removed and they're going to receive this healing and be brought to a condition that should be rightfully theirs. Beautiful. So there's a healing process and where it's described to us why there's these um, disfigurements in the spirit body, isn't it? So they're the two things that we want to talk about in depth, I reckon. Healing and why the spirit body has been affected. Yep. Okay. What do we learn about next? Glenda? There's an in-depth discussion or question and discussion on the difference and the reasons for um, justice and mercy. Yes. And when and how they're applied. Yes. So we learn about mercy, justice, and I'm going to say the law of compensation, even though it's not named... So I'm putting that there to make sure we talk about it. So now we're nearly at the end of the chapter, aren't we? What, hap- what, what do we hear about next? It's really just... <laughs> Renee? Uh, it's just the colours and the smells. The colours and the smells, yeah. I want to talk about that as we go through the healing and the chorale. Just really what happens at the end of the chapter. Fred comes back, we've had the big discussion, and it's just really the dissolution of the chorale, isn't it? And we see these these people who've been... um, They've had all this deformity and things heavy on them that's been lifted, they've had a sleep, and then they're sort of welcomed, aren't they? Yeah, so let's just call it the the dissolution, if I could remember how to spell that, dissolution, or the conclusion, perhaps, of the chorale. Okay. So I thought if we just outline the the broad um, things that happened in the chapter, and then we'll just talk about them in section, that way we won't skip anything, But you can see why I think we need at least two weeks and maybe three to get through this. Because in each, you know, we've written three or four words, but as you know, there's just so much written about each thing, isn't there? And lots of meaning in there. Okay, so one, two, four, five, six, seven, yeah. Okay. Let's have a drink of water and we can get going. So let's talk about the the first... What's happening at the very start of the chapter, this first thing, when Fred feels drawn? What struck you about this, this part of the chapter? Jason? It, it wasn't manufactured, it was natural. It was this f- f- feeling that resonated within him and without, without at the outside of him, so completely through his soul. This calling? Yes. Yep. So it's, it's he's feeling called, or he's feeling drawn, and he describes it as a type of magnetism, doesn't he? I want to talk about this word magnetism because it's used a fair bit. What do you think? It, he, what do you think this idea of magnetism is all about, Diana? It felt to me that it was um, a, a desire. He had such a desire to serve, and I felt the others seemingly with this responding, a desire to serve, and and they're responding to an an opportunity. 
and felt to me there was a lot of joy and even though they didn't know perhaps. So yeah, do you me, think that they were th thinking about no, it? No, no. They were just responding to this opportunity, this joyous opportunity it felt like without anything intellectual being a part of it. Yeah, so what would cause that to happen? Uh, to me it felt like, I don't know, just desire and law of attraction. Uh, yeah, sort of, yeah, yeah. Um, Jennifer? I, w I was getting the feeling that that's how the soul works. You know, that's the pull of the soul. It's very powerful. Yeah, yeah. Okay, uh, let's hear a few more people, Jen, and then we'll talk about it. Is it about the law of rapport that perhaps there was this feeling in Fred that he had not identified but the calling occurred through this law of, like, vibration or, um, I'm guessing, I'm asking really, a law of rapport where that the feeling drew him, for, drew him forward and he wasn't aware of it, but he just knew to go, like a vibrational thing. Yeah, and everyone, as, as someone was saying before, everyone's going, aren't they? Everyone's being drawn in this way. So, if we just um, hear from Rita and then at the back there, if you keep your hand up, Rita. It, it says here, magnetism is the strength and nourishment of the spiritual body. And I thought maybe it's God's love or maybe it's, um, oh, I just forgot how it's called. Um, I can't, I can't remember That's enough okay. of what I wanted to say. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, so in, 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 um, there are six or seven expressions for it, and one is chi energy or God's... Like pranic That's, energy yeah, or pranic something. Yeah, pranic energy yeah. or something no. like that. That's not it. No. Uh -huh. uh, AJ, you've got a mic on, baby, yeah. There's a, it's a formalised event. So it's an event that's been organised by somebody else other than the people being attracted. Yes. And, and the fact is that everybody felt an excitement about the event about to occur while not knowing what the event would be. But they all felt an excitement about an event occurring that's been organised by somebody else and they knew in advance that it was being organised. Yes. So is this a clue you're giving to everybody? Um, well, yeah, if people follow down that track, that I track. feel they'll have a far closer idea of what's actually going on. Because it, yes. it, it, it's not just an internal feeling, because it's obviously external, the fact that lots and lots of people are feeling it at the same time. Exactly. There has to be a, an external feeling coming from somewhere, motivating each of them to finish up gathering into the same location at the same time. Yeah. Mm. Okay, if we go to Suzanne or Raj or both of them, <laughs> they're elbowing each other out of the way. <laughs> <laughs> um, it feels to me a little bit like it's part of God's love in the way that God communicates um, energetically with everybody, like a magnetism that um, that brings everybody together in one thought. Sort of a quality of love, though. Okay. Any other ideas? I was going to say that it's a, it's it's heaven's way of communicating through a resonance. <laughs> Okay, in, yes, in same, I like this. the same way that we would speak here, but it's, it's a totally different level of communication and what one we be, haven't got to yet. What would be resonating, Raj? It's a vibrational... Um, hmm, yeah, I was going to say like a hook, like it's like a drawing. And what's, how could we be drawn in that way? What would uh, be the a, resonance? Through a, a, a frequency that resonates with a certain, a certain nature. Yeah, we're all getting very intellectual. <laughs> Just go back to the soul and remember what AJ said about it's something that's been created by someone else and now there's a resonance, uh, you're right, there's a resonance be, being that say it's me and Deirdre and Laleen. We're all being drawn towards this thing. What, what in us... What would, it, what would it be about us that would create resonance? A, a, a commonality. That, yes. That what we, would we have in common? It has to be love, the level of love that exists. Would it just be love? A desire, passion, uh, 
I mean, clearly not everybody in heaven turned up. No. <laughs> and they might be loving. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. So it's a, it's a certain group that are into healing, that are into the ability to release the beauty within themselves. All right. Let's go to someone else because there's people jumping out of the chair to say, thank you, Raj. Yep. And? Uh, I feel it's the desire, the soul's desire for truth that's yeah. drawing them. No? Go to Nat. <laughs> no, you're not wrong, but it's just not the full picture, or as I understand it. Just yeah. in the excitement that everybody's feeling, I, I felt it was God's, sorry, I felt it was um, the divine love in people's souls being summoned by God. That's what it was for me. Yeah, I know I don't think it's as complex as that. <laughs> If we go to the other side, Tim. Uh, um, yeah, I suppose when you're speaking of a magnetic connection, then one pole would have a certain characteristic and the other one would also have a cooperative characteristic. Yeah, and this is where we need to just... Magnetism here is used as a metaphor, okay? So it's not literal... Uh, AJ went into this explanation of what magnetism is of different poles and fields and it's not that okay but you're right if we yeah. use it as a metaphor so i was going to say that yeah so the person sending the signal having their own particular desire has a certain signature or flavor to it yes and it's the people who also have a similar desire in that same signature yes so if i've created an event there's a there's a specific set of desires within my soul and they're going to resonate what with other people who have the same desires, okay? So if, if I've set up this event, I want to um, help others heal. I want to understand more truth. I want to display more truth. I want to create beauty. I want to... What are the other things that are done in the chorale? Call on God to assist with healing. Uh, all of these things, if I have that desire in me, it, it's a soul-based Remember, our soul condition is not just our emotions, it's our desires, it's our belief systems, it's whether we're in a state of judgment or openness, it's all of these things. So it's the soul condition in that desire that will resonate with the other people who have a similar thing. Pretty cool, Pretty cool hey? Yeah, yeah. Okay, if we go um, Nina, then Pierre. Um. There was a line that really struck me that I feel puts it really lovely is that but the most pleasing thought of all was that every voice would say our father to the self same God and feel at heart that they were members of one family. Yeah, yeah. So it's a very unifying event, isn't it? Very beautiful. Yeah. Uh, Pierre? Yeah, he is saying about feeling an appeal uh, for help and assistance. And he has a strong desire, and he, he's saying he feel I alone had the power to render, so that all people who have a strong desire for help and assistance, obviously. Absolutely. So all these people are, join, are gathered together because they really want to help others, don't they? We can see that in Fred, and if we look at everyone at the chorale, they all want to, don't they? They want to assist these people who have been victims of circumstance in their life. Yeah. So this creates a magnetism between them all and draws them all together. Awesome, hey, you don't need email. <laughs> yeah, or the phone or anything. Just, just have that, that pure desire and people will be drawn. Now, let's think about how this applies to our life here on Earth. Lizzie, are you thinking about that? Mine just goes slightly personal is that when I was living down the Gold Coast, I had this pull, this desire to move up here. I couldn't stop it. Yeah. Um, so I'm likening it to that. I know that feeling that no matter what, I, I just had to be here. And yep. for me then, it was seeking divine truth, that that was my desire. Nothing would stop me. So that yep. was my... So you felt drawn to a group of people... Yes. ...who had a similar desire. Yeah. Yeah. And the beautiful thing that I think about is something that um, I used to neglect a lot, is then looking around, because we... How often in your life do you find yourself surrounded by a group of people with a common desire? Like all the time. You enter a profession, whoop, we've all got the, like a similar desire just in what we studied or just in what we decided to do with our lives. Um, when, we, when we 
people become parents or mothers, they often have mothers' groups and, or friendship circles. Very often, groups of friends, they're all single or they're all married or they've all, you know, there's very similar things, hey? So this is what you're feeling. The other thing to look at and what, the, what this uh, example is showing us is that it's not just one particular desire that draws us together, is it? Like in the chorale, a great number of things are happening, aren't they? And so we could just say, oh, they all just want to help with healing. But is that the full extent of it? No, there's many other things that they're desiring. They're desiring God's assistance with healing. They're desiring truth. They're desiring... If you think about it, these people, and we'll get on to um, exactly why these people have been affected in the way that they have, but just having read it through once or twice that you have, can you already see the parallel between their life and Fred's life on earth? Can you see that? So that's another part of why he's been attracted to this specific event. You know, he's desiring to have compassion and love for people who've had these similar experiences. Not consciously, it's just a part of his soul. So if we look at our, the groups that we find ourselves in on earth, we could apply the same kind of principle, couldn't we? We could say, now we're all drawn together here in this room because we have a desire for, to learn more about our soul. Would that, is, do you think that's true? Yeah? And we want to involve God in that, don't we? So that's true also. But there's probably a, like a thousand other things within our souls that would mean that all of us specifically would come together in this room today. And it might be different, you know, like some weeks we have a small group, some weeks we have a big group. And it's fascinating, I feel, to really look at our, the groups that we're in, look at who's around us in terms of, wow, what can this show me about my own soul? What, is, what are the common desires? What desires am I growing? What are these people demonstrating to me about, you know, my... It's, and it could be a sympathetic attraction or it could be an opposing attraction, you know, where someone I'm willing to be this sort of person because that, you know, an addictive thing as well. But there's, there's many things that we talk about. Often we talk about them in terms of, you know, looking at your errors. But this example shows us what it's like in a very loving, pure way. So don't forget about that bit, because it's awesome. <laughs> That's where we can go to. Um, one of the things that AJ and I talked about last night, um, which relates also to this magnetism part of it, and perhaps if we move on and just let's look at all of the other references to magnetism that happen in these first few pages. So, um, and I'm... Look, I've made a rod for my own back here because I've said we're going to talk about it in sections and now I want to jump a section. But anyway, <laughs> AJ's smiling knowingly at me. <laughs> so we hear that magnetism is the strength and nourishment of the physical body, don't we? Of the spirit body. <laughs> I've written the wrong thing there myself. Um, so what do you think that means now, given what we've learnt about magnetism? Does it mean we need magnets around us to... Uh... <laughs> Kelly reckons maybe we do at this stage, you know. <laughs> Jen? It means that we're edified and uplifted and that we grow in that when we're drawn from our soul to a place or other people, that it's always a positive thing. Even if there's some sort of negativity or addiction or something like that, it's always a positive thing and it, we're always edified. We always well, have the I, opportunity to grow. Yeah, I used to think that on the natural love path. I don't actually think that anymore. Um, I think that it's always up to us if we decide to grow. So we can have a set of experiences and they might not edify us because it has to be our decision to engage that growth. And also sometimes that's, I feel that's a way that we get away from um, feeling about injustice. That's what I used to do anyway. You know, when we say, oh, everything has its purpose and we'll always grow from it, we, we then distance ourselves from how much it can hurt that someone's actually done something very unloving to us. Do you see what I mean? Yeah. 
So I don't feel that that's what it's referring to here as that magnetism is the strength and nourishment of the soul. Yeah. Because actually, yeah, Jenna, do you want to, um, just before the mic goes away. Yeah. And I'm actually going to call on AJ to speak about this well because I, I have a problem with the sentence. <laughs> but he said it very well um, to me just before we started uh, because... I feel that um, I just have a big block around metaphysical issues because I'm so, I'm like a bit militant about the soul. Let's not talk about metaphysical soul, which is very unloving of me at times. Um, yeah, go ahead, Jen, and then we'll go to AJ. Is the magnetism another way of describing the law of attraction? Yes. In a way, if you think about it, it Magnetism is describing the law of attraction in this case. Because it seems like that is the nourishment and the strength of the spiritual body and the soul. If we engage it, yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So, but I think that there's more to it than that. Like, I feel that the, the magnetism that he's referring to here that's happening in the chapter is that, um, because as we see on page 68... The group is working together, the group in the chorale, to create a magnetic condition suitable into which to introduce the patients. So there we, talk, we use the word magnetic again, at which to me is creating a, an atmosphere of healing through this loving desire. Is there like an, an... like If you get more people of a similar attraction, of a similar magnetic resonance... Does it um, magnify the effect? Yes. Okay. It does. And this is leading me to something that I wanted to talk about. But if we just go to AJ, if, babe, would you mind telling us the beautiful way you summarised when I asked you the, that <laughs> about the magnetism is the strength and nourishment of the spiritual body? I can't remember now. <laughs> <laughs> I, I can't. I'm sorry. Okay. Okay, it doesn't <laughs> um, matter then. But I'm just thinking, though, that um, it's a combination of factors, isn't it? It's not just one thing. It's, a, it's, it's firstly a combination of... It's firstly Siamedes in his, in his role as a healer. Yep. Um, he's, off, he's come from a different dimension to this dimension as a role of a healer. Now, because he has such a powerful soul wanting to heal other people in this certain uh, unfortunate circumstance, and because the power of his soul is much greater than the location of where he's going to, every single person there feels an excitement of being involved in the process. Yeah. And, um, and he doesn't have to schedule a time... He doesn't have to ring up everybody and say, yeah. you've all got to come. Um, but rather, they feel his soul. So that they're actually feeling him too. Yeah. And they feel drawn to, to, to him to do the same thing as he's doing, even if it's to a lesser degree. And is this the case also that um, when someone is a leader or someone is in a higher condition, their pure... Ba like, what my feeling is that their pure desire creates an attraction to people who have that desire. They may not be in the same development as them, but it creates an attraction. Mm. So it pulls people in. Mm. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. yeah. And, and so it's not just a simple matter of um, each person's individual desire. Yes. Because how do they know to go to that one location? Yeah. It's because somebody has chosen that location and that somebody has a stronger desire even than they do to be at that location to, to heal these particular people. And everyone can feel the excitement of that, but they also feel this same, so, same feeling he has to a lesser degree that they would like to be involved in that process and so they feel drawn to yeah. the same location as he is. And that's why they call it magnetic. It's, it's the same kind of thing that occurs in a physical level of when we put a north and south pole together you know, you put them close enough together, eventually one feels the other and then they pull themselves together. Yeah. And, and it's exactly the same thing occurring in a spiritual sense with regard to a certain flavour of how love is going to be expressed. 
And can we um, then use the magnet analogy then and say the person in the um, higher soul condition with the very loving and pure desire is like a huge magnet mm -hmm. and he's going to attract to him all the little metal castings that have that similar baby desire within them like that. Exactly. He's the most powerful magnetic force. In it. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Okay, good. Whew. We got it. <laughs> Thanks, darling. Uh, Tim. Yeah, I just I was wondering if, um, like, the way that the corral structured and I suppose the power of Siamese's soul, would Siamese have actually been able to perform that by himself without um, having the corral? Well... I say no, and this is this is what I wanted to talk about. Um, I say he could he could perform healing, and he could ask for God's help. And of course, um, that is going to be super powerful. But it's not as powerful, I believe, as him asking, along with thousands of other people asking at the same time. Is that true, AJ? <laughs> It's such a like crazy thing having you in my audience because I can just feel you so much and I'm just like, ah! Yeah, I, I would say yes, he is totally able to do it all himself. Okay, good. Um, however, the benefits to everybody would not be the same. Yes. In particular, the benefits to the givers would not be the same because they wouldn't yes. be involved in the process of giving. So he's he's not only... He's not only exercising his desire to heal the people who are in the unfortunate circumstance, but he's also teaching the other people who have exactly the same passion and desire within them how to go how about to do doing it. it at the same time. Yeah. So, so he is totally capable of healing them himself, but, but is that the best thing to do? In this case, definitely not. It, it's the best thing to involve lots and lots of people who have a lesser desire than he and a lesser condition than he, but and to show them how to go through the process so that eventually at some point in the future they can all become Siamedes doing the same thing with another group of people. Yeah. yeah. And I guess that I view the chorale as something that's healing for every single participant, like in, in some way. Like Fred, he's there participating un, sort of unwittingly and he's learnt just a huge amount just in that. Yeah. So technically... To, so I speak the truth, Siamese can do it on his own, <laughs> but I guess the feeling I have is the outcome is not the same because so many people are not as involved. Uh, Kelly, is this on the same point? Because I just, yep, go for it. Um, I just visualise uh, like we're a symphony of souls and the conductor is standing at the front yep. and leading the orchestra and that's who we are in the orchestra playing the music and, and it wouldn't be the same if the orchestra's not there and the conductor could do it by himself but the um, benefit of everybody sharing that together is beautiful. Yeah, well, the quote that Nina read out about everyone with the, with the same God, feeling this feeling towards God. But I think that AJ is saying like Siamese with God especially, could generate even all those sounds and all of those things, but the beauty of having the people, the individual souls do it with him is that they, they actually are gifted with something as well as through their desire to give, ironically. Yeah, yeah. Okay, uh, Deirdre. Yeah, I kind of saw it as like when um, you're a medical student, like the surgeon can actually like perform the operation himself, but the students are there to learn. So if they weren't there, how can they be students? Or oh, sorry, the surgeons later on. That's how I saw yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. It's like yeah. a teaching. Teaching, yeah, yeah. absolutely. Okay, um, Mori. I thought it was interesting that there were, there were exactly the right number of chairs. <laughs> so the, yeah. the right people were there. It's pretty beautiful, hey? Yeah. 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 So there was no mistake about who would be attending. <laughs> Something that um, AJ and I talked about last night, though, relating this again to our earthly experience, okay? So 
We were talking, I was talking to him about the beauty of so many people com like coming together with this beautiful common purpose and desiring to involve God in this whole thing. And I was talking to him about the qualities that the people had. They were displaying a lot of... They were getting themselves into this condition, weren't they? They were longing for, longing for a beautiful outcome for these people. And they were... Siamides was helping to generate this um, atmosphere of faith within them. And they were all trusting him. They were all, and they, were, they weren't just trusting him, they were trusting God in that process, weren't they? And they, would, they were really working towards a common goal. So my question to you is how often have you experienced that on earth? No? Um, when that was pointed out before that um, we're all one family... I was reflecting on my life about how that's never happened. And um, it brings up a lot of grief about not belonging. Yeah. And how even though I'm trying to develop a relationship with God, there's a very big part of me still that doesn't see myself as part of God's family. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So there's that grief, isn't there, of always feeling kind of excluded or not fitting in but I want to flip that over and ask you guys how often and it was a very powerful question for me also how often have I entered a group in a spirit of trust and faith and with a desire to meet a common goal led by someone Even if you think about being at an AJ seminar, there's someone at the front trying to lead you to God, basically, <laughs> with every breath. And how many of us, and I include myself in this, especially when I first met AJ, sit in the audience and feel critical, untrusting. Uh, we don't want to be led. We're, we're just, you know, or, or something he says, go, oh, wow, that really moved me. But now, what are we going to have for dinner? Um, <laughs> yeah, he said, I've heard that before. Um, <laughs> you know, this kind of disengagement that often happens. And if you think about flipping that over again, what would it be like if we were all there, if we entered the corral <laughs> with this burning desire for God already within us and this, okay, I'm going to trust because I know that if I trust, I'm, I'm going to be led to truth anyway, aren't I? But if I don't trust, it's a fear-based place and I can never find more truth. But if I enter, we, we judge trust so much, don't we? We say it's weak. Trusting is weak. But actually, trusting is very powerful. Children do it all the time and they don't become powerless or don't learn they learn more, don't they? Because they engage. And then sometimes it hurts or they realise, oh, that's wrong. But they, they learnt that, didn't they? And they never would have if they didn't trust. So when AJ, AJ brought up the example of just sometimes when he's in front of an audience, and I don't know if you want to talk about that at all, babe, or... <laughs> I feel like, ah, again, I want to go home. <laughs> <laughs> Do you want me to leave the audience, babe? No, I don't. <laughs> I just feel like I'm fumbling today, that's all. Yeah. Um, yeah, like a lot of times you can feel the disparity in the desires of all of the audience. A lot of the audience is working in totally different directions to where you're attempting to go. Yeah. And as a result of that, um, there isn't a very positive outcome and there's a lot of negative spirits with the audience as well and, you know, everything is very mixed in its, in its results. Yeah. When you have an entire audience totally engaged, they don't even think about themselves anymore. They, like, they, they put up their hand uh, without even thinking about it. They don't have any self-consciousness. They are totally absorbed in the subject matter um, there's hardly any negative spirits around them at all um, and, and the entire atmosphere is totally different. It's rare to have a talk like that. Yeah. Um, but the entire atmosphere is totally different. You can feel 
almost un under normal circumstances, you can feel almost every person in the audience working in an opposite direction to what you're working in. And the difference here with this particular thing, the magnetic corral, is that Siamedes has the full attention, the full trust, and the full absorption of every single person present. And every single person present is totally absorbed and involved. Yeah. And as a result of that, there's a huge power that, that then is like a prayer to God that then God can add his energy to and his feelings to. Um, when, when everybody is very, very mixed in all of their opinions and thoughts and feelings and so forth, then there is no common opinion or common feeling that God can add to. Um, yeah. Everyone has to be added to individually rather than there being this multiplication of a collective feeling. Yeah. 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 Mm. yeah, and I suppose that's what struck me. And that, I suppose that's where I had a question as well about just Siamese alone with this desire, what he can achieve. But then if you have thousands of people with the same desire, can God act more then? That's... That's why I answered no to Tim's question, because I thought he can act more if all of us desire it. So is that true? Um, yeah, that, yeah, that's definitely true, obviously, yeah. because the, the atmosphere created by the collective uh, feelings is greater than the atmosphere created by the individual, unless the individual is in a much better condition. Now, obviously, Siamedes himself is in a very, very good condition, um, he's a friend of ours. We, you know, he, he's a one with God. Um, we know him, myself and Mary know him. So um, we know his condition and we know, you know, that it's in very, very good condition. He, he is totally able to individually create healing for every single person present, including the people who are the singers. Yeah. Um, however, um, if he arrived in that location where everybody was resistive, everybody had no trust, everybody was like, oh, what's going to happen here? I don't know if <laughs> well, I Who's this character? What's who's he wearing? Character? Is that some kind of a dress? And, yeah. <laughs> and, and who put him in charge and all that kind of stuff, right? Yeah. Um, then obviously <laughs> the actual event itself could not occur. Yeah. Um, he would have to go to a better place, a, another more developed condition for the actual event to occur if the people involved weren't collectively involved in the manner that they were. Yeah. He, he is perfectly capable of providing healing for all of the people present, in fact. But um, the actual event could not occur if all of them were in a different condition. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. That's very clear. Does anyone have any questions about that? If we go Tara, then Jason, and then we'll go to you, Jen, after that. It wasn't a question, but it, yep. it sort of reminds me of when AJ's talked about um, the Jehovah's that come together to build the um, temple. Yep. And everyone's got that common goal and that pure desire. Yes. So they're all, it's all in harmony. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So even like if that's a, on Earth, even yeah. if it's not the same desire as what they're demonstrating in the corral, yeah, the magnetic corral to like generate healing for someone's spirit, body, or whatever, they're just coming together with a desire. Hey, let's build a place where we can all come and meet, mm. or where other people can come and meet, and and they come together. There's a common focus, and as he's described, it like works super well yeah. everyone's laughing having fun and they build an entire like hall in two days or two weekends or something yeah, yeah. so yeah. i have a, a lot of like feeling about how this is so possible that we do mm. this you know yeah. but it means us really looking at our own role in that like um often i guess it's easy when i feel when we go into our emotional condition and we feel like how we've been left out and like excluded and never felt this unconditional love from people and that's we have to feel those feelings but concurrently I feel there's growing the desire to extend that love to other people and to to be humble enough to follow a, a common purpose with a group of others yeah yeah okay uh Jason yeah so that corral that happen as uh, I suppose is a pretty common event with yep. looking after souls what sphere would that 
happen in? I believe it happened in the second. Yeah. Yeah. So, did I, who thought it was in a higher sphere? Yeah. Yeah. No, in the second. Um, as AJ pointed out to me today, all of the lessons in this book are basically first and second sphere lessons. So w what we're seeing happens, all of the book happens pretty much in the second sphere. Uh, I think he visits some people in the first sphere and things, but everything that happens, the lessons are things that you would learn in the first and second spheres. So it's kind of breathtaking, the, the beauty that's there, hey? Yeah, yeah. Now, Jen had her hand up. Yeah. It's so lovely that so many people want to share and ask. Tara touched on what I was going to add and ask a question. Um, I can recall very clearly a feeling when I belonged to organised religion in the Mormon church where we would go each Sunday with a common purpose and worship and sing and there was definitely a collective feeling of upliftment there and you would go each Sunday with excitement. Yeah. And then um, in visiting the temple that belongs to that church too... Um, everybody would be there in service and assisting and helping the person who was entering the temple um, to have the best possible experience. Yeah. My question then is, is this then not an act of worship of sorts? The chorale. The chorale, definitely. Yeah, yeah. A, yeah. a kind of a worship in that do you, the do assistance you, sorry, to God, go you know, like, uh, yeah. Yeah, um, and if you read the passage where... <laughs> I'm just laughing because I'm totally not sticking to the guidelines, but anyway. Um, structure, <laughs> control. Um, when it talks about Siamides and the prayer that he says, you know, it, it, it's full of gratitude, isn't it? He's saying... Um, um, Thine, O Lord, is greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty. All that is in the heavens and the earth is thine. Thine are the kingdom. So he's, he's, you know, he's saying all these wonderful things to God. And, and the prayer was done and there was no supplication. His confidence and faith declared that to be unnecessary. The presence of that host around him was more eloquent, sorry, this is page 72, an acceptable supplication than he could frame. Uh, so it's a very pure sort of worship, I feel. Like he's not, it's not flowery and he's not, it's just pure faith and gratitude in action and it, yeah, from the heart and it engages God, yeah. So I feel it's a, it's a form of worship, the type of worship that um, my desire for worship is always that I would worship as I do the things in my because God is, God is relevant to every aspect of my life so that I could um, bring God into everything that I do, um, then that, that seems like a great kind of worship. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, uh, if we go Barb, then Nina. And on this side, if we go to Lorleen, so we'll go Barb, Lorleen, Nina. Yeah. Mary, I felt with, um, personally, um, with this um, drawn feeling that there was a lot of trust in that. Everybody had trust that they were, you know, that there was no question about it. So the drawing was a bit of trust for me. It made yeah. me reflect on um, when my little um, son just started walking. Um, just one day he just reached up and took my hand and um, just... made me feel that there was so much trust in that taking of my hand that I could have led him anywhere, but he still just trusted me ultimately. Yeah. Yeah, and that I reflected that when they were drawn to the corral, yeah. that there was so much trust there. Yeah. That's so beautiful, isn't it? And if, if we use that analogy for us with God, how powerful would it be if we just trusted and... Um, trusted that everything he was bringing us was just going to bring us closer to him if we were humble to it. Yeah. Yeah. It's beautiful, Barb. Thank you. Lorleen? 
Um, uh, just going back to the revelation that um, Fred had, um, and you mentioned the pure um, common goal. Yep. And it's like um, when there is a pure common goal, the excitement of that, yep. which is really palpable, um, it awakens and it's like a revelation of um, my or whoever individual unique passion in how to serve towards that common goal. Yes. And um, so I was trying to bring it all together as to the children and it went all through the whole different ranges and they wouldn't have the same sort of uh, desire in the same way but their passions were awakened to serve a common purpose. Yeah. And um, so their uniqueness yeah. was activated also yeah. in how they serve. Yeah, so yeah. it was awakening. It's like when there is a goal, a project that is really exciting, um, I won't do it the same way as somebody else does it, yeah. but it creates an excitement in me that just says, oh, I could do it like this. And, yeah. um, and, and that gives the richness to how this chorale would be different to another one or... Something like that. That's what I was... Yeah, the unique expression. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. AJ was just speaking about in the um, the soul... He just did a, an interview about the soul and he was talking about everyone's unique expression, everyone's unique personality in its pure state being an expression of God's personality and um, a, a one part of it, you know, and we've all got a unique one and... If we are in it in a pure way, we can come to know God, not just from connecting with God, but by connecting with you and understanding part of God's nature in, in you. So, yeah, every chorale under that, if we think of it in that way, would be different, wouldn't it? It would still be led by a conductor and towards a common purpose, but the soul uh, offering of each person. Yeah, yeah. Hey, Jay. <laughs> I feel like swapping places with you, babe, so much. I should perhaps join you down there. But, um, yeah. Um, the, I was just thinking, though, too, about how every one of them was humble enough to cooperate. Yes. Um, like, we're often on earth what happens is everybody has their desires and their passions, but nobody wants to cooperate with each other and nobody wants to listen to one person direct the whole thing. And, and yet here we have an example of a whole like many thousands of people gather, gathering together, cooperating with one person who's directing the entire thing and, and they're still expressing their desire from their soul but they're doing it in cooperation with that person. Yeah, and I suppose that's why I added at the end there'd still be a conductor. You couldn't just rock up and go, no, I'm dancing today. You know, <laughs> I'll be here. And um, like you, you're, it may... Um, activate in you this, wow, I actually love the dancing part of it or I love the singing part of it, but I'd still be led by the person, the conductor, the person who's leading. Yeah, yeah, cool. Uh, if we go to Nina first. Yeah. And um, then my Julie. question is what, I can understand the participants and what drew them, but what qualities <clears throat> made the healing possible for those that came Obviously, they were victims of circumstance, but were there certain qualities of their soul that they were selected for that process? What makes healing in us possible? You mean as the receiver, of, as the person being healed or the person giving the healing? The, the, per, the people who were healed. Who were healed, And the yeah. question came because Jason asked what sphere did this happen in, so it struck me that these people must have had a certain condition of love to be yeah. placed in that circumstance. Yeah. So my question is, is like even for us, what makes healing like that possible? Yeah, okay, good question. Let's throw out the whiteboard. Let's just go for it. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> no, it's absolutely fine. I want to be led by where you want to go rather than me trying to... Um, I'll just use that as a, to go back and think if we missed anything. Um, these, and this I wanted to raise with you guys. Do you remember last time we met, some of you were like, no, your causal emotion gets removed. It's in the next chapter. And I said, no, it doesn't. Like, this is, and what we see here is not a description of people's causal emotions being removed. So is everyone clear on that? So let's talk about the type of people... 
what do we what do we read about the people who are who are having the healing performed upon them? So but they, they were victims. They were victims of circumstances. Circumstance. And it actually goes on quite a lot. Seventy seven, yeah. The restrictions binding these friends have been worn in violence to their better judgment. What does that mean? Alex? Uh, Like a restriction of their free will? Yep. In what they felt was the right thing to do? Yes, exactly. Yeah. Um, So they are lacking power to conquer the forces opposed to them. They have become victims of circumstances and have passed their lives in an irksome bondage, being dominated by wills and usages they could not successfully resist. If they had given a ready consent to custom and dogma, followed with unquestioning faith where others led, and been content to crush the right to think, they would have, required, they would have developed the required littleness of soul without necessity to apply restraint." So let's talk about these people. This is a very special type of people, I feel. These are people who haven't willingly conformed with the errors in society. In fact, their true desire has been to lovingly confront the errors in society. And they have never submitted their will, like, willingly. It has been imposed upon them, the restrictions. Yeah, Alex? I was just going to say, they kind of been a lot like Frederick himself, where he swam against the tide. Exactly. And he just did what he felt was the right thing to do um, against the judgment and everything else that he, he sort of uh, was projected at him in life. Exactly. Yeah. And that's what I was kind of referring to when I said, like, his presence even there is not by accident, that it's these types of people that he's seeing healed. He, babe, I'll sit on the table if you want to sit on the chair. No, I'll sit on the table. That's fine. Okay. Um, yeah, I feel this group of people are just so <laughs> beautiful. Sorry. <laughs> beautiful and unique. What I wrote was they're people that have not conformed to society's will. They've decided to stand up for truth and confront society in a loving manner. And, and that's why the restraint has been applied upon them. Do you see this distinction between someone who lives in a society that's full of error and they accept the error and they conform to it, then their soul shrinks. When they, they do not submit their spirit or their will to, to that, then, then restraint is applied upon them by their circumstance. And that's why he describes... Um, well... Um, He talks about the restraints on their eyes and on their limbs and um, their prophetic utterances were dangerous to a craft, hence the gag must be applied. Their eyes saw visions of coming glory for the weary and oppressed, therefore their sight must be distorted, lest the interests of a class be endangered. The intelligent vigour of the child proclaimed a leader in the man, and church and dogma forged letters to cripple his power and forced the noble stature of the giant into the contortions of a dwarf. So this beautiful spirit within them that wanted to lead and challenge and change, people around them suppressed them, constrained them, and that's why we see this on their bodies. I just find it very beautiful, um, and I suppose... As I said to AJ, it brings up a lot of feelings that I have about him. Um, I don't think I've ever known anyone who's successfully um, stood up for truth as much as he has. Uh, and, um, and I witness how he's constrained. <laughs> and I just suppose that I pray for courage to be one of those people also. Because I have... 
a lot of shame now to consider how much I have conformed with people around me all through my life just in order to avoid their disapproval or their rejection or any of those things. And that goes in all aspects of my life with family, friends, in my profession, all kinds of things. I neglected the, the cries of my soul, if you like, in order to just make peace on the day or to... Um, <laughs> you know, to be accepted, basically, yeah. So these group of people that we're witnessing the healing of are very special in that they never did that, yeah. Can I, can I ask everyone a question? Is that oh, okay? How many of you thought that it was talking about the healing of causal emotion? Be few, honest. A few of you did last time. Because... Uh, in the last group you had with Mary, a large number of you believed that and were quite firm in your statements of that. But, but the reality is it's dealing with the effects of. So, so these, people, um, these people were in a state where because of the constraints placed upon them, their, even their spirit body was so it got so badly distorted that now it needed a doctor, Siamedes, and a group of people to supply the energy to fix the problems that their spirit body had been created in their spirit body through the suppression process. It doesn't mean though that the actual emotion in the person was actually released. They still needed to go through a process to to release that. We. Yeah, do you want to give the example of the broken leg? Yeah, it's a bit like a, a doctor um, who, who gets a patient coming to him who's broken his leg. Would the doctor go, oh, you've broken your leg, mate? And, he, and the patient says, yes. Well, I can't fix it, I'm sorry. It's on your left side, feel it's about your mother. It's on your, your left side, so it's got to be about your mum. And, you know, like, would he do that, you know, like... Well, no, he wouldn't. What he would do is he'd fix the broken leg, wouldn't he? And then if he was a very, very good doctor, and particularly any doctor in the spirit world would do this, um, he'd be going, well, now, do you realise what caused this break in your leg? And the person would say, oh, it was because I fell off a scaffold or something. And you'd say, no, no, I don't mean that. I mean, why did you fall off the scaffold at that particular moment, at that particular time and fall that particular way? that caused the break in your leg because all of that's to do with some other things that are inside of your soul. And so what Siamedes is doing here is he's a bit like that doctor who's getting the patient who is full of these contortions because of their life and he's, he's taking away these, all of these uh, distortions to their body so that they can at least live a life that allows them to discover the underlying, em, what emotions have been imposed upon them during that process. So he's, he's attempting to fix the physical form so that they then have the scope to address the other emotions that are present within themselves, which is what a good doctor would do, wouldn't it be? Like if you loved, you would do both things, wouldn't you? Like if you love somebody, you wouldn't just go, sorry about the break in your leg, mate, but... <laughs> You know, it might mend itself, but I can't see it mending. You know, you, you, you could sort of, if you, if you applied, as many of you do do, unfortunately, at times, if you apply the so-called principles of the law of attraction to people in a harsh manner, like many of you do with each other, um, you will often treat somebody that way, but, but Siamedes didn't do that here. He, he could have said, oh, you attracted that, and there must be some reason why you attracted that. Right. Couldn't, he could have said that, couldn't he? But, but it wouldn't have been a very loving thing for him to say under the circumstances, would it? Yeah, that, that's what really moved me as well when I was reading this section of the chapter and then a couple of hours later I had some feelings with God and with my guides about, about how much I do treat myself like that. I punish myself not only for what I've done to harm others but what I'm carrying from the harm that's been done to me. And um, I found it so moving that he says, life must be lavished upon the sufferers until we've helped to build up and invigorate their souls. So, you know, so often I think it's easy to forget that God has created everything to give us life and love. And um, 
I tend to view it from a very injured place that I'll only be getting the love, even though I know the truth is different, guys. But my emotions don't always know the truth is different. My head does. That, you know, I'll only be getting the love when I've dealt with this badness in me and the truth is not, that ca- not the case. And, and when I'm entering humbly into this process, then God can lavish more love onto me as I go through it. It's just that um, I tend to be very stark and, uh, yeah. Oh, where do we go? Anywhere you want. <laughs> yeah, let's go to Graham. We have heard from Graham. And over to Kel. Um, what would these people have looked like when they were on Earth? Like, uh, might some of them be autistic or something like that? A lot of them look very similar to yourself, Graham, actually. Um, and at the moment, you, even for yourself, you don't understand how much constraint your mother in particular has placed upon your body and how it's actually distorted your, your spirit body. Um, so if you could actually see your spirit body, you would see different pinions and things pulled into it. Uh, very similar in description, in fact, to, to um, what some of the descriptions are here, where the, there's almost like... A, you, you know how um, if a person has... What's that disease where you need the... Uh, obviously, there's a lot of diseases where you need it. Um, braces, leg braces. You know how you've got those pinions and everything to right your feet? and uh, There's many things that... There's many things that, that you might, yeah. might cause it, of course. But you know those metal things around your body? Well, if you can imagine metal things around your body that are pulling your body into distortion, not pulling your body straight, but actually pulling your body into distortion, the reality is that many of us have uh, those kind of attachments on our body. I have one still myself at the moment or through my shoulder here. There's like a great big... Uh, you can actually see a mark on my skin where it actually occurs physically, where I've got a little hole sort of shape thing here on one side and on the other side there's an identical almost whole shape on the other side of that left side of my shoulder and there's actually if you describe it from a spirit perspective there's actually a great big rod going through there that's been imposed by by relationships with women but but began with my mum and and it's still there still present in me I haven't taken it out yet does that make sense and, uh, and so for many of us, they don't look very dissimilar to ourselves <laughs> in a physical state, but uh, they've had many constraints placed upon them through their life uh, and particularly during their childhood that caused them, their body to be, their spirit body to actually be distorted. And those restraints and constraints are taken off of them in the spirit world through a very similar process, uh, like a ceremony. It's a ceremony... Um, that involves many people um, and it's a, it's a beautiful ceremony to remove some of the effects on the spirit form of a person who has been damaged without their will being involved. Yeah. Is it possible to do this on earth? Well, that's what you're doing. The, descri- the, the thing that I'm describing for you to do emotionally is actually doing this to your physical, uh, uh, to your spirit body's form. So it is actually healing your spirit body's form. Yes, it is possible to do it to yourself, firstly. But secondly, it is also possible to remove these constraints in a group or collective method, as Mary has suggested. Um, It is definitely possible to actually have a ceremony like this on earth. But as you can see, it requires the will of thousands of people to be involved in exactly the same direction at exactly the same time trusting the person who's the conductor exactly and uh, and for that to occur requires a lot of changes in our conditions because it because we even find it difficult to cooperate with 20 other people let alone a thousand other people i've i've actually had visions of us being able to do that on earth Mm. so if it's not really directly related to causal emotions um how do we if we've got these sort of um, restraints on us, how do we go about it? You know, if we can't get to a magnetic corral, how can we do something about it? Well, you remember the magnetic corral is only re- re- removing the effect, not the cause. 
So the fact is that if you address the causes of these particular emotions within you anyway, the effect will automatically be removed. So the, the corral is only removing the effect and not the cause. But, but secondly, um, it is possible to remove the effect using en energetic, you know, energy in the process of healing. It is possible, particularly with God's help, to remove a lot of the effects of people's maladies. So this is how I healed in the first century, right? You know, so people who couldn't see, they obviously had an emotional reason why, a cause within them as to what caused them to become blind. But, but I healed them. Um, which is healing the effect of their blindness, not the actual cause of their blindness. Because to heal the cause, I then had to educate them how to go through the soul-based process, which is what, you, what I've been talking about with groups of people now for 10 years or so. So what I'm suggesting is if you follow the soul-based process, the effect will automatically occur. But in the future, what we'll be able to do, to do once one of us, and it only requires one of us to be in the condition of at one with, with God, once one of us gets in a condition of at one with God, that person can now assist us to remove the effects instantly <coughs> as long as we're willing to address the cause. And Which... does removing that effect make it easier to deal with the causal? Very yes. much so. Yes. Which is one of the reasons why we're pretty passionate about becoming at one with God. Just like these people that we see, they are so bound down that they can't even see or move. And once, once the, um, the restrictions, the effects are taken away from them, they have this beautiful sleep and then they're welcomed into this life. Then the real teaching of them begins. Um, but they're able to do it in a much more liberated way. Mm. So at the moment, many of us have physical ailments that actually are caused by emotions, uh, some of it of our own choice, in other words, some of the things caused by what we've chosen to do, other things by what other people have chosen to do to us. And, and if you imagine, if we could remove all of the ones that other people have done to us and the physical ailments, then of course every single day is automatically a brighter day um, and therefore it's much easier to engage the process of dealing with your emotion than it is having to also deal with the underlying ailment uh, that's caused by the particular emotion. So, so certainly healing has a role in uh, recovery, but, it, but, but not healing that avoids the emotion. You know, healing that avoids the emotion does not have a role in the recovery, really. Whereas what, what's happening here is that these people, as you saw at the conclusion of the ceremony, they went off with somebody and uh, that person had been assigned to them specifically to assist them through the process of dealing with emotions within them that they now needed to address and, uh, uh, in order to have a, have a happier life in the spirit world. Yeah. Um, as I, as There's I, quite a lot of questions. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Um, I was with a friend last week who isn't on this path and just sharing my uh, excitement and joy reading, uh, you know, in this book club and just sharing that um, beautiful principle of God's gift to us and removing, you know, people, while well, I was describing to her with people in wheelchairs and, you know, sicknesses and it was, I was crying telling her mm. and um, she, she wanted the... Um, details of the book and the, your blog to follow on herself because she was, you know, amazed herself when I was sharing it with her. But it's just such a beautiful gift from God that to remove the effects, let alone yeah. then hmm. what we can go through for the cause. But just um, in here, he, he's describing this and what we're talking about. And he says, be not deceived. The diseases of the soul resulting from personal sin are only removed and cured by slow and painful processes. Yep. But the unavoidable defects caused by others' sin or force of circumstances have a speedy rectification in such corrals as that to which I draw your attention. That's and that's correct. describing yeah. exactly yeah. what you're saying. Yeah, yeah. It's totally. beautiful. Yeah, it's better. 
Okay, if we go to Igor and on the other side to Ray again. I just I wanted to mention that. about the healing process. It's very real. It's happening at the moment on Earth. I've seen a documentary. It's called uh, Signs of Miracles by <laughs> Greg Barron, where they showed a woman with breast cancer and in, in Asia and two people projecting um, love or uh, imagining that she's already healed or something. And they had a live X-ray where they showed a fairly big size cancer removed in five minutes. Mm -hmm. the, the only problem though with that, Igor, is that it does not address the underlying cause as to why the creator, cancer was created in the individual. And so, um, you know, that, that would also need to be addressed. Otherwise, the, there's a potentiality of the person getting cancer again. Also, many of the cancers and other illnesses on the planet are not actually caused by our own uh, causal emotion, but they're actually caused by a spirit attachment. And, uh, and it's quite easy to remove a spirit attachment from a person um, and therefore cure some of those particular diseases. So it's not correct to assume that every cancer is caused by your own uh, problem. It's often caused by something that inside of you that attracts a spirit and that spirit uh, causes the cancer in your body. So it's still caused by you to some degree in terms of what happens but it's not always the same cause. And I feel what happens a lot on earth is everyone starts assuming that if I've got cancer of a breast or something that it has to be the same cause and it doesn't have to be the same cause. And also they assume that when they're healed, that they're actually healed. And it does not mean that the soul is actually healed. And it also uh, can be that a person can be cured of a disease without the person themselves even changing an emotion. And the reason why that can occur is because it wasn't their disease in the first place. It was the disease created by the spirit who was attached to them. So every single situation is different. And so you've got to be aware of the differences if you know, to know what you're doing when you're healing. And the difference in the spirit world that we see would be that we wouldn't perform healing on someone who didn't have a certain set of soul-based desires within them already. Although, would... although, if you think about it, we, would, we can perform a healing on somebody even if they don't have a soul desire to heal themselves if the cause of their physical ailment is not themselves but rather a spirit who's attached to them. Does that make sense? So the reality is we can actually cure certain ailments in other people if the person themselves isn't the cause of that ailment. And so it, even if they are unwilling for you to go through the process with them, you can still do it. Hmm. Because it's the, it's the spirit with them who, who's the issue in many cases. Yeah, so it's, again, it's sort of like every situation is individual. Yeah, mm. yeah, exactly. Yeah. 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 Okay, Araya. Um, well, the first time I read this about six months ago, I did interpret it with my knowledge at the time of uh, it's removing the causals from everything that wasn't my own choice to do, from my parents yeah. and whatever. And then reading it this time, I was confused as to examples of what kind of people would be victims of circumstance. And now hearing you understanding that it's the effects that get taken away but yet, don't we all, won't each soul that passes in essence have a, a degree of that from the wounds of, that they got from their parents initially? I mean, won't almost every soul have some level of that because of that initial... Araya, some have mm -hmm. far more than others. Um, if you can imagine, for example, a person who lives a life where their parents basically kept them imprisoned... Uh, most of their life because whenever the child went to do something, the parent uh, punished them or, or, or restrained them in some way. And then the parent sold that child, like in the case of a girl child, sold that child to a husband and he did the same thing with her as she's done, she, like as her parents did with her all of her life. She has not, every time she tried to exercise her will in a different direction, she got punished or, or, or harmed in some way personally. Um, and she didn't give up, she still tried to do that and eventually she died. So imagine that kind of a life. Um, this is the kind of person who, this, that Siamedes is healing under these circumstances. Um, 
you, that's very different to the average person in the Western world and their life, isn't it? Like the average person in the Western world, by the time you're five years of age, generally, you get to do a lot of things that you want to do. Um, and uh, by the time you're 10, you often get to do pretty much anything you want to do nowadays. <laughs> um, if you think about little, your little son, he's getting everything he wants when he's three. So, so you know, there's, you know he, he doesn't have that same kind of injuries, even though he does have soul damage. So, um, you know, it's a very different situation to, to what we may imagine. Um, and this is what we've got to consider with these books, is that... Every one of these situations described has specific circumstances underlying them that we need to understand if we're going to understand completely what's being accomplished. Yeah, yeah thanks for clarifying that because when I read it and my question was, you know, what are examples of people on earth that that would be? Would it be a soldier in Hitler's army who was no. forced to do it and no. now it didn't feel because right, but a child sold into sex slavery, yes. something like that was, I guess, the answer that God finally gave me is... is Exactly. Like a, a person who went to Hitler's army? No. He's an adult. He could refuse and get shot. And, and the reality is if he did refuse, he might have gotten shot uh, or got you know, thrown in a concentration camp, but his soul condition would have been much better if that had happened to him than if he went ahead and became a part of the army. Yeah. That's using their, their will. Remember, it's the will that has been s suppressed Whereas the soldier in Hitler's not, army has used his will to yeah. engage Hitler's army, yeah. or, or any army for that matter, not just Hitler's. I don't know why we use Hitler as an example. Well, it's just as bad if it was, uh, you know, an American army or a British army or anybody else's army. Any soldier that engages that, um, whether whether feeling constrained or or doing it willingly, he's going to have different levels of condition in his soul that's not the same as what's happening here. <laughs> The example that I used last night when I was talking to AJ about it was someone who's now born in Africa um, where there's extreme poverty and there's a lot of militant activity. Um, someone who chooses to live a peaceful life and tries to be honest in that environment would be an example of someone who would be on one of these couches. Someone who grows up and relents to the violence and becomes a part of it would have a completely different set of injuries then. Mm. Yeah. So the reality is the majority of people don't come under this category uh, because they um, usually relent to the fear and therefore take actions in harmony with the fear that they purposefully choose to take. And that is a completely different set of injuries. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. You choose, darling. You uh, I can't see anybody. Okay. Let's go, Jason. <laughs> Jason. And then is, who's got the hand up over here? Yep. If we go Glenda and then Ant after that, yeah. I just had a feeling also too, working with disabled people that born in that yeah. condition of disability, they would automatically would receive that uh, healing? Certainly. Um, <laughs> however, there are some circumstances where they may not be the case, uh, but the majority of the circumstances for a disabled person, would be, that would be the case. Yeah. And that's why I said that we would only perform healing on people with a certain set of desires. I didn't necessarily mean a desire for, that they would then heal their causal emotions, but someone who's born with a disability, their desire can be very pure inside just to engage with life and, uh, you know, they're not going to um, tarry after the, the, um, the healing is performed, yeah. Yep. yeah. Yep. Okay, so over here we have Glenda. So just to clarify in my mind, the people in this specific circumstances are a very small chosen group of people with specific injuries. It's not a general healing. I don't know if I'd use the word chosen. Well, uh, that, yeah. You know, they are people with very specific injuries that are related to the constraint of their will without uh, um, the ability at any point in their life generally to utilise their will in a different direction. Yes, I suppose I'm just asking, this is not necessarily a general healing for the general population. No, that's why there's only, what is it, seven or eight people down in front of the audience um, rather than the thousands. Yeah. 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 And um, I was listening to your talk on um, the free will this morning mm -hmm. and I could only go get to about half an hour of it because the confront of you know, how often I have exercised my free will in opposition 
to God's truth and God's love. Mm. So this is this conversation now is reminding me that you know wherever we have exercised our free will in opposition to that truth or that love, then um, you know we can't count ourselves amongst. Exactly. Said, and we can't expect the effects of that to no, be healed that's right. either. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Yep. Without our will being exercised in a different direction. Yeah. That's correct. Uh, Ange? Other Ange? <laughs> so my question is for, for like the people who are being healed, if it's their parents or whoever is put these restrictions on them, mm -hmm. do the people then who've put the restrictions on them, do they feel it m more? They will already the have in their soul the compensatory effect of the damage they've done to these children or to these people. And so there's no extra thing being added to their soul. The thing happens to their soul, the, immediately they take the action to constrain the other person's will. So it's not like now that somebody takes it off of theirs, they add it to somebody else. It's already been added to the, the, the law of compensation has already added it to the other person's condition. Would it come up for them as a feeling, though, when, when this happens? Um, highly unlikely. It, it potentially could, mm. but highly unlikely because usually the person who's been in, a, in the position of harming another's will is a very de desensitised <coughs> person already, and so therefore it's highly unlikely they'd be sensitive enough to feel the damage that they've done to the other person at the time the damage is removed. So it's p potentially able to occur, but usually it doesn't. And the reason is because of the desensitisation of the person who's been the oppressor. The person who's the oppressor is often so desensitive to any, any action in harmony with love that when something happens to one of their victims in a positive direction, it often doesn't affect them at all. Yeah. And can I ask... Um um, you just look really thoughtful as AJ's answering. What comes up for you around oh, my it? own stuff, like Ange yeah. said about how you've harmed the free will of your own children. Yeah. But um, I was thinking actually of when Dad told me some truth about what he'd done, his sexual um, deviancy in his own family. Mm -hmm. And I immediately felt like a weight had been lifted off me, even though I'd never known it. But when he, after 30 years of finally hearing the truth, yep. I felt like, I felt lighter. So I wonder well, that's, that's different to the question you asked. Yeah, I wonder whether it worked in the opposite way. No, it doesn't work in the opposite way, but that way it certainly works many times. If the parent goes through a process of even acknowledging something that's in error, then the children immediately feel the benefit of the, of the restriction being lifted upon them most of the time, unless the child has already embraced a life in harmony with the error. So, so, for example, if the father uh, had, had said sexual deviancy in his, in his life and his childhood that he doesn't admit to, and uh, as a result of that he abuses his own son, let's say, and then his son grows up and, event and doesn't admit to that either, he eventually abuses some other children, then, then it's highly likely that the father realising something won't affect the son in that condition or circumstance. But if the father had grown up uh, and with some sexual deviancy, had abused his son or, or you know, had the feelings even of abuse towards the son and, and the son had not yet acted upon those particular uh, feelings in a negative direction but rather felt the oppression of the abuse himself, then when the father admits to the abuse or admits to something going on in the family, immediately the son will feel some kind of relief about getting into the emotion. Yeah, and for yeah. me it just felt like a weight had been lifted, even though I never even knew that I was carrying it. So. Exactly. But yeah. it must be because you were carrying it, yeah. <laughs> and it, it, yep. by your dad acknowledging it, he took it from you carrying it to him saying, this is mine, and you can go, oh. And he acknowledged the truth. Mm -hmm. And whenever a person acknowledges the truth, There's it's always a relief yeah. in our soul, even though we're yet to feel the emotion. It's sort of like... If it, 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 you notice in these groups sometimes when I say to a person, oh, you've had a very difficult childhood, initially, immediately they're in tears <laughs> because it's the first time anybody's actually acknowledged <laughs> that they've had a difficult childhood. Even their own parents don't acknowledge it. You know, the parents go, no, you didn't have a difficult childhood. How dare you say that, you know? And, and the parents uh, react very differently. And as a result, the child then feels it can't even say the truth. And when somebody then says the truth, it's like, oh... 
At last, somebody said the truth, you know. A yeah. big relief. Thank you. Mm. Um, Monique? I don't know if this is the appropriate time to ask, but um, it's about the mercy and justice and forgiveness. Um, uh, well, questions. there's two things we could do with this. What is the time? It's a, that's what I was about to say. <laughs> it's, it's five o'clock now. Okay. We did start late. Yeah. Um, there's two ways to approach this. We have AJ right now, and I understand that's a gift. Um, but I do want to spend a lot of time on what's outlined in the Mercy and Justice section because it's very important that we get it clear, I think. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think it's up to you if you feel like... Well, I feel it's better question. to raise it in your next group, perhaps, where you talk about it in a lot more detail because um, it is a very important section of the, of the chapter and it's very important to understand... The relationship between mercy, love, justice, forgiveness, repentance, all those relationships are quite, quite well uh, established in this chapter if you understand them correctly. And so. the way that it, it operates on earth and why it operates that way I think is pretty powerful. Mm. And yeah, so if we leave it till next time, Mon, if that's all right. Um, do you guys want to, oh, we've got 10 more minutes. I'd like to, uh, would you like to finish, babe? Oh, no, you're, you're the leader. Not so much anymore. <laughs> I'm just a guest. <laughs> I'd like to keep going for 10 minutes if you're happy to. Yeah. Um, so, any more questions on... Well, do you want us to keep talking about the healing stuff? Trev got a question back there. I've got stuff to raise, but... So, basically, um, once they go through this process, they've still got their own law of compensation stuff. They could possibly... They would have their own law of compensation stuff and they have to go to the place that suits their soul condition and process through like anybody else. They can do it yes, the natural love way or the divine love way. That's true, Trevor, but um, mm. as you can see, if, if somebody else has had control of the person's will almost their entire life, yeah. then there's going to be very little <laughs> that they're going to have to compensate for yeah. in comparison to the person who's controlled their will. So it's a special class of people, so that's, yeah. Well, it's not a special well, class of they, people... No, not, yeah, yeah, I didn't say that. Right. Yeah, it's more, it's a, more a, a, what's happened to them on yeah, earth. They've been and tortured or they've, been, they've drawn a short straw, so to speak. And so, yes, uh, yeah. they've had a very harsh life on yeah. earth where they haven't been able to exercise their free will so very, very well at yeah, all. It's very unlikely that they've done anything uh, that's in, not in harmony with love because they haven't actually had a chance. Exactly. So controlled, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Or they've been people of very pure principle who have acted, used their will in harmony with love as much as they possibly can and been restricted in, in different ways because there's so much error that rules the earth. So, yes. so they're not bitter about they, they've been controlled and all these things happen, but they've actually still got a good heart. Good they do, but sometimes place. they do have a feeling of bitterness and, and anger about the control that they do need to address and release uh, that is separate to this process. Um, sometimes, uh, if I can give you some examples, perhaps that might help in terms of what happens here. Um, these, often these people who have been harmed like this um, have some anger about their will being controlled and some of them think it's normal that their will is controlled. Does that make sense? So some have had their will controlled for so much of their life that they actually think that it's normal to have somebody control their will. And so they have to unlearn that. So there's, a pro so, so there's still a process they need to go into the discovery of more truth. But um, what happens here is they at least get all of the effects of that uh, terrible treatment removed from them because it wasn't their caused. They, they didn't cause it. So they get the effects of it removed from them so that at least they're now able to address the emotions within themselves that would cause them to accept such treatment. Um, remembering, of course, that, that many of these never accepted the treatment. They had the treatment forced upon them. Yeah. Mm. Thanks for that. Mm. Yeah. If we go to um, Geraldine. Um, wouldn't the, um, the treatment of the magnetic corral um, where the effects are lifted have started an emotional process? in them in, in a lot of cases? Um, 
Of course, with these people, you've got to remember, these people that are being examples here, they have only just arrived in the spirit world. They have not woken from a sleep yet. They've had such a traumatic life that they are in these constraints, these physical constraints that are like you know, metal constraints and bars and distortions to their body, and they are asleep, not able to move, and they're kept asleep until this particular process. So, so they're not uh, usually allowed to wake up. Um, by There's methods that spirit, uh, you can use in the spirit to help a person stay asleep, to help them deal with some of their exhaustion. And so what happens, by the time they reach this corral, they're ready to wake up um, and, and therefore ready to begin living their spirit life. And so what happens is they go through this particular ceremony which helps the removal of all those constraints. It's, it's, so it's, it's not like they've had a time in the spirit world already to deal with something emotionally or anything like that. They are, just, they are now at this point where they're kept to sleep long enough to at least release some exhaustion that they have and then they're taken along to a ceremony like this still asleep still unconscious um, and then all the bars and everything are removed and then they become conscious and from that moment on what they choose to do is very dependent upon their will many of them have very little exercise of their will up until that point in their entire life and so one of the first things they need to do is discover how to use their will in a positive direction and so that would depend very much in a lot of ways they're very much like children who have uh, not had the ability to use their will yet in what they're then taught yeah. i kind of have a feeling though that some of them have they have developed enough knowledge of themselves to know what they desire mm -hmm. at, because they've desired to change society. So mm -hmm. they have at least that, like they have an understanding. They have an idea of what should be happening yeah. and so therefore they do have some idea of what they'd like to do but, but because they've never been able to use their will or very rarely been able to use their will in a direction that they wanted, they often need help in showing them how to do that. Yeah. Could some of these people include people like political prisoners who have really stood up for what yes. they've believed in and been tortured yes. and cut down yeah. sort of thing? Definitely. Yeah. Yes. yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Um, if we go to Nat, he's had a hand up for a while. and um. Um, I'm just inquiring, like you're saying that these people are asleep, like that sounds like a pretty loving thing if they've had such traumatic lives... But then I've, I've seen spirits removing the barbs and things and such deformities that you're describing and I've seen people feeling something or having an emotional reaction to the removal of that. Mm -hmm. Are they actually feeling a causal emotion at that point or are they just crying about the effect of what's happened to them? Um, it depends, again, on the circumstance and situation. And the circumstance you're describing is where a spirit, by being involved in healing a person on earth, by helping them remove one of these bars while they're still alive and while they're, still, they're now conscious and awake while this is occurring. And if you're conscious and awake while it's occurring, yes, there is a chance that you'll instantly go into an emotion that was a res that that is is related to the thing that's being removed bear in mind that this is not related to things that you've created but rather the th things Damage. that other people have created in you yes mm -hmm. however it is true is it not that the conditions of our spirit body um, when we've used our will out of harmony with love will still appear as deformities Deformed and at times barbs and different things. So you may be seeing... But they're of our own creation. Yes, yeah, something of a person's creation. And therefore would not be removed... By a spirit. By a spirit yeah. before the emotion was addressed. Only okay. through the use of the person's will. So it's always only... When, whenever I've seen something like that, it's always been damage done to that person. Exactly. Yeah. It will always be damage done to the person from another person, like a parent or some other person in society. Yeah. Um, rather than something the person themselves has chosen to do, which results in similar deformities, but, uh, but those kind of deformities cannot be removed unless the person goes unless through Unless the person process. is doing it. So yeah. one, a spirit might do it, but if the person is engaged in releasing their emotion, they might be doing it. 
So from a place of repentance then you start to heal. Yes, the you'll also you see a similar thing if you've got people when you're healing them in a physical state and you can see what's happening to their spirit form. You will often see if, you, if they go into a state of repentance that a certain bar or different thing to their spirit body is removed and that is the direct result of them going into repentance okay. about that particular issue. Thank you for clarifying yep. that. Okay, we should probably finish up fairly soon. If we, but if we just take the last three questions, so Tim, Jen and Jen. Yeah, I was just wondering where um, those spirits might go like as soon as they pass, like if they're in an unconscious state, like um, maybe if you give some insight into, um, you know, are they just out, like probably not, but are they just you know, out in the field? <laughs> no. Laying down because they can't no. move? Or do they go to they're home kept or? in hospitals, what you would call a hospital. Um, and they're kept asleep, what you would call sedated, but it's not done with chemicals. Um, for a number of reasons, uh, some of those reasons are to remove them from the influences of the people who harmed them, and other reasons that are to do with the exhaustion of the, of the spirit body and its ability to actually do anything. So sometimes things can happen to you through your life that your spirit body is so exhausted that it's impossible for you to even move when you arrive in the spirit world. And as a result of that, uh, those kind of people generally are kept in hospital for a period of time where they're, you know, they're usually surrounded by a lot of natural substances that both keep them sedated but also infuse their body. Uh, they it actually, like herbs and other substances like that, that infuse their body and help their body recover to a point where they're going to be able to sustain life and, uh, you know, and, and some kind of direction where they can actually move. Understand that this is not the same as people who arrive in terrible conditions in the spirit world from actions they personally have taken against others um, because those people uh, have to engage a process of repentance or, or compensation, one of those two processes for those particular things to be removed. So, so this is only usually the initial phase of the person entering the spirit world and once they go through this process in the hospital, or the, you could call it like a clearing house almost, um, then what happens is their soul attracts them to the true location of their, you know, based on their soul development and their soul condition, which could be worse, and in many cases is worse, than where they initially arrived. Yeah. yeah. Thanks. Um, does the magnetic corral only happen in the second sphere or do these kinds of gatherings happen in other spheres as well for different purposes? Um, the magnetic corral as described in this book only happens in the second sphere or the top of the first sphere. Um, so it only happens in those two locations generally. Um, yeah. After then there are different types of um, what you would call ceremonies. Um, but they don't involve the healing of the spirit body because that would have already been accomplished in the first or second spheres. So, yeah. um, I'm feeling a lot of passion around this subject. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if you and Mary are in a condition that um, you could direct this kind of a healing thing? Well, um, Siamedes was in a condition of one with God uh, in this particular example. And in fact, all of the spirits who conducted, even Kushna, was in, is, in a spirit, is in a condition of one with God. And all of the spirits who, in fact, interact with Fred after his past um, in terms of his education are all at one with God. Um, and the reality is there needs to be a person at one with God on the planet for this to occur in a pure state. There are things you could do in, in a more impure state, uh, which are like involving spirits in the process. So, you know, the at one, the, uh, what's it called, the blessing, the one, oneness, oneness blessing. blessing. That is an attempt by spirits to involve themselves in a similar kind of a process, um, but unfortunately without full understanding of what's really going on. And the only problem with that is that there is a distortion of truth that happens as a result. So until somebody's at one with God on the planet, it's going to be very, very difficult to actually have a pure 
uh, thing organised in that condition and, and with, with similar results. Would it, be, oh, would it be worth doing even if it wasn't in a pure state? No. 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 Well, I'm a purist, as you know. Um, <laughs> no. Oh, like, I would never personally agree to doing something unless it's in a pure state. So, for that reason, none of you have been healed by me yet. Does that make sense? For the same reason that it wouldn't be pure, me doing it in a pure state. Um, so, for it to happen, it would have to be in a pure state. So, in other words, I would have to be at one with God, connected with God, connected with God's desire, and also connected and understanding, you know, the person's emotional condition before I could engage the process. Yep. When you become one with God, would you let me know? Because I'd like to participate. <laughs> um, you'll probably be able to guess when I'm at you one You probably with God. won't need the invite, <laughs> Jennifer. It'll, you'll just arrive. <laughs> Um, in the, in the but, first century, it, um, I travelled around teaching these divine truths for, for nearly six years before I became at one with God. And, uh, and for those six years, um, I didn't do any healing at all. Um, so, um, and that's the same now. I won't be doing any healing at all until I'm connected with God. And, and if you think about it, it's not actually me doing any healing anyway. So in this case, Siamides isn't really doing the healing. He's really a channel for God's love to heal the person. Does that make sense? And so all that happens when you become at one with God is you basically become a channel for God to exercise his will through you. Or if you're a female, for God to exercise her will through you. Remembering that, of course, that... It'll, because if you're a female, you'll be connected, of course, to the feminine side of God uh, and be able to reflect the femininity of her nature. Whereas uh, if you're a male, then you're going to be connected not just to the masculine side of God, but dominantly to the masculine side of God and reflect the masculinity of God's nature. And, um, and once you're in that state, then you can do a lot of things. And you won't need to ask a person if they're in that state. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it'll be pretty obvious. <laughs> but if I could inspire the group, because we do need to finish. Uh, remember the first question I asked you was about just how often have you come together in a common purpose, for a common, like in a pure way to serve a common desire, a loving desire. And while we might not be able to have our own magnetic corral just yet, I do feel we can work towards that goal, really, even though I know I'm obsessed with goals and it's an injury. <laughs> but... <laughs> I have faith and hope that we would be able to come together as a group before anyone is in a condition of atonement um, to serve a loving purpose um, and activate our faith and trust in God, which will raise our condition when we do that. So this and is why, one reason why we've created God's way of love. It's a great way of you beginning to address the underlying emotional reasons why you cannot cooperate with each other and why you cannot cooperate to a common goal and why you find it so hard to accept direction from an imperfect person. Um, you know, so why do you want everything your own way? You know, these are great. It, engaging the God's way of love teams is a great way to address every single one of those emotions. And if we address as a group of people those groups of emotions, we can, although we may not be able to do something like the magnetic corral, we will certainly be able to create many very powerful effects on Earth of a cooperative effort all exercised you know, in a common goal with a person who's leading it with a very, very clear direction. And, uh, and what we're attempting to do with God's Way of Love is help you address your emotions as to why you can't do that now. So many of you, you know, when many of you get upset when something happens in one of your teams, or you feel annoyed, or these are all indications of how you cannot cooperate and what emotional injuries within are causing us to all be out of harmony with even just a spirit of love. Um, so as Mary points out, you can, you can address a lot of those emotions before, and you have to address all those emotions actually before you become at one with God. So why not use the teams as a great way to address those emotions and get to the point where the entire team is working for common goals, common goals, common goals, where you're willing to, to put yourself in a humble position 
in terms of the acceptance of the goal and embrace it with full passion and desire because that's what these people had to do. And, they're, and you, you say they're only in the second sphere. <laughs> so, so what does that mean about us yet? We're perhaps not yet <laughs> in the second sphere if we can't do that. Um, now, there are many of you who have started to do that, which is really lovely to see. Um, but it's going to require, you know, working your way through the reasons why you can't. But if you imagine a group of people do that, um, and we embrace, that means that whatever we embrace, we're going to be able to cooperate. Whatever we embrace. We're going to be cooperative about it. Whenever we set up a team leader, it doesn't matter who they are, we're going to cooperate with them. You know, like, it, it's going to be fantastic when you think about it. We, we can set up some goals uh, and then go ahead and do them. And all of us are just, like, will be overjoyed by the outcome. Yeah. And we won't be bickering or going, oh, I don't know why I said that. Why did they do that? Why doesn't that happen? Why, you know, why is it like this? Why is it like that? If you think how many times you've had those thoughts in the last couple of years, um, you can see that there's quite a few different emotional injuries within that mean that we need to address those particular feelings uh, before we're going to get to the stage where we're all in this space where we can actually accomplish something as a team of people with a pure motive. But once we get there, and you don't have to be at one with God to get there, then it's going to be very, very powerful what you start creating then as a team of people. Yeah. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, babe, for your wisdom. Thanks, guys. So you're enjoying the book club with Mary? Yes. Yeah? Yeah, that's good. I think um, their enjoyment upped this week. <laughs> oh, I don't know about that. It's, uh, it, have you found that going through it week by week is a little different than just reading it yourself? Yeah. Have you found that? Yeah. Now, I think a lot of times when we read things ourselves, we read things just for the goal of reading it, to say we've read it. or you know, to, to, But when you go through it like this, now that you have to be a lot more self-reflective, hey? and uh, I think that's very powerful. Uh, and I, th I can see, we we've already seen, haven't we, babe? Yeah. Uh, effects in different people that we felt were fairly hardened to their position, and yet through this process they've sort of softened, um, which, which I feel is one of the benefits of doing the book like that. Yeah. Yeah. So. Thanks, Anyways. everyone, for your participation. We'll see you on Thursday uh, at the Wandai hall, the Wandai Town Hall. Thanks for being so flexible. I know we're all over the shop, but that's our life. We don't plan very much. <laughs> well, if we plan, it usually changes. So, <laughs> oh, We're waiting for the day when we were just going to go, oh, I feel like having a group today. And, and everyone will be drawn. And everybody will just draw it. <laughs> <laughs> so we rock up here and there's already 100 people here waiting for it to happen.